In this video, we're going to do a deep dive into Green Goblin, AKA Norman Osborn's spider Foes affiliation. Hey guys, Rich from Rich Big Gaming. Hope everyone is doing fantastically well. And yes, welcome to this, the continuation of our affiliation breakdown. And this is one that was requested by quite a few of you on the last couple of videos that we've done. So I thought, why not jump in and take a look at these spider foes? It's an affiliation that I haven't played a lot of late, but they have had some reasonable new additions and with some confirmed new members coming hopefully early 2024. Uh, I actually think these guys could be really, really good. And in particular, in this video, we are going to be looking at the leadership of Norman Osborn, aka Green Goblin, and ranking each of the members of the spider Foes affiliation um, as if they were under his leadership. So let's first of all then take a look at Green Goblin and see exactly what he does. Um, so Green Goblin, aka Norman Osborn, he is a four threat leader, so that's quite nice. Uh, three and four threat leaders I do really, really like. It gives a lot more flexibility when it comes to actually building out your roster and your squads. Um, He's going to be a 4-3-3 defensive stat line. He's got 7 stamina on his healthy side. He's a size 3 because of that glider. He comes on a medium base and he has a medium move. So medium move, medium base is really, really nice. Um, it gives you that little bit of extra maneuverability uh, and potentially somebody who you could play eyes on the prize on should you wish. Um you would need to get an extra power on him though. So um, we're going to go through both sides of his cards because he changes quite a bit from one side to the other. So on his healthy side, he has two attacks, Pumpkin Bonds and Knight of the Goblin. They're both physical on the actual card themselves, but both have the option of choosing whether the attack is going to be physical or energy. So that's really nice, picking your opponent's uh, weakest defense. Pumpkin Bombs is going to be a range 4, 5 strength, and it's going to be power equal to damage dealt. And on a wild, he triggers bags of tricks. Before damage is dealt, the enemy character gains one of the following special conditions. Bleed, poison, or incinerate. Um, interesting that it is before damage is dealt, and it really doesn't change anything. The only one that really changes anything when it's before damage is dealt is stun. Uh, but who knows, that may be something that happens later on or in you know future cards or whatever it may be and the knight of the goblin his spender it's going to be a range three it's going to be seven strength and it's going to cost four power and once again you get to choose if it's energy or physical and then if this attack deals damage after the attack is resolved the target character gains the poison and incinerate special condition so no um no dice trigger on that one but it does need to do damage we're going to skip oscott weaponry for a moment but he's got a hit and run pretty standard he's got a trick and treat or trick or treat which is quite interesting it's a reactive superpower it costs three when an enemy character ends and advance or is placed within four of this character this character may use this superpower. Choose an interactive terrain feature of size three or less within range two of the enemy character that was advanced or placed. Destroy the terrain feature. The enemy character suffers a collision as if the terrain feature had collided with it. So this is sort of a different take on the whole tricks and traps and booby traps and that sort of thing, whereby you do need terrain, but it has the potential to do, I would say, on average, more damage, especially if you get a size 3 off. Um, however, it is only an advance or a place. So whereas a lot of them will just be end of movement, which could be a push and it could be a throw as well, this is just an advance or a place. But it does give uh, Norman Osborn um, quite a bit of protection, and it does stop people coming towards him too closely uh, for those those sort of bigger range to attacks that they tend to be. Um, 
So you really need to think about your positioning with, with Green Goblin, making sure that he does have terrain around him, um, or indeed using other characters to move them over. He has arch nemesis Peter Parker. When attacking Peter Parker, this character may modify or re-roll failure results and may re-roll any number of attack dice. But whilst that is an amazing ability, there is a kicker to it as well. At the start of this character's activation, if there is a non-dazed enemy Peter Parker within range 3 of this character, this character's first action must be an attack action targeting that Peter Parker, if possible. Um, so he is forced into um, making his first action being an attack, and it has to be against Peter Parker if he... You know, if he's within range three. Um, so you need to think about this. This hasn't really been too much of a problem if you're playing spider Foes because original core box Peter Parker wasn't great. Um, ASM was overshadowed a little bit in uh, Web Warriors by Miles Morales, but we do now have the brand new version of Spider-Man that comes in the new core box and he is very very good indeed so maybe something that you see more often moving forward and then lastly he has got flight um so yeah he can he can fly which is quite nice it means that you always get that medium move uh, unless you're slowed or something like that but um yeah it's it, it's quite good um pretty solid in terms of a fourth threat and what he does he's got a little bit of tech on there but let's have a quick look then at the reverse side, so his injured side of his card, because it does change, as I mentioned, quite a bit. Um, so he goes from his 4-3-3 uh, three, three defensive stat line up to a 3, or down in one sense, but a 3-3-5 three, three, defensive stat line. His stamina drops from 7 down to 5, and then everything else on that side of his card remains the same. He does, however, get a couple of extra things. So his pumpkin bombs is one extra strength. So you get one extra dice for there, uh, which, you know, is, is definitely quite nice. Uh, he used to be a 4-4 four, four on his pumpkin bombs on the front side and a 4-5, but his glow up gave him extra ones there. And he does lose a couple of his superpowers. So he loses that hit and run. And in place of hit and run, he has glider ram. This is going to cost three, and it's this character is thrown medium. If it, it does not suffer damage, if it collides with another character or terrain feature, the superpower can only be used once per turn. Um, so this essentially is the pounce, the assassin leap, those sorts of things that we've seen, but it's coming from a size three character, which is quite nice because that's four incoming damage. Um, so yeah, it's it, it's pretty darn good. Um, he keeps the arch nemesis, Peter Parker, that stays there. But then he also gets Unstable Psyche. This character cannot interact with or hold objective tokens. During the power phase, roll five dice. For each hit, crit and wild rolled, this character gains one power. So he gets some extra power, but he cannot interact with or hold objective tokens. Now, what does that mean? Let's break that down. So extracts, or at least the vast majority of extracts, um, he can interact with to pick up. Now, the one exception to that is going to be the researcher because the researcher really acts more like a secure. Um, and any pay to flip, he isn't going to be able to interact with um, to be able to flip that point. So he is limited in terms of um, what he can do from a VP scoring perspective. So that's always something to bear in mind. And then lastly, he has access to the flight still. So let's go back up and take a quick look at that Oscorp weaponry leadership. Um, so it's once per turn, while an allied character is attacking, during the modify opponent's dice step, it may re-roll one opposing defense die. Um, so this is both, well, I mean, this is a, a, a really, really good offensive tech piece of tech. And let me tell you why I think this is a better option than than anything else. Um, so first of all, um, the number of successes that you have for uh, attacks is greater than those for successes in defense. So what it means is that when you re-roll that, that defensive success for your opponent, it means that they are 
or you're going to be far more likely to roll something that isn't a success for them. So its chances of having an impact um, is actually really, really high. And overall, this is actually better when you look at the numbers um, than an offensive reroll for yourself. Now, obviously, there are other variables in there as well. Um, let's say, for example, that your opponent uh, has got some triggers on their defense. Uh, let's say that they count wilds as two, that sort of thing. That's always going to help as well. Um, so, yeah, it's it's pretty darn good. It's definitely on the offensive side. And I do really, really like um, how thematic it is. It feels like it's something that, that Norman would be able to do. So, with all that said and done, let's take a look then at our tier list. So, we only have, I want to say it's like eight, I think, in total characters that we're going to be ranking maybe nine um but we're going to be ranking them s through to d and remember this is going to be them under the leadership of norman osborne s is going to be absolutely amazing really really good it's probably going to be making it into your list every single time a tier is going to be really good very consistent um probably make it into your roster but maybe don't get into your squad maybe they're a little bit more situational B tier is going to be absolutely perfectly fine, perfectly serviceable, um, really, really good character. C tier is going to be, mm, they're okay. They're probably a, a half decent character. It's not, I wouldn't see them in somebody's list and be like, oh my word, what are you doing there? Um, but it may be that there is another option in affiliation that is slightly better. And then D tier is going to be really right now, Probably don't touch that character. Uh, maybe look at a splash character that you could put in there instead because they're either missing something, their stats just aren't particularly great, um, or they need a little bit of a, well, and they need a little bit of a glow up to bring them more within that bell curve. So with all that said and done, let's jump in and take a look at our first spider foe. So coming up first then, guys, is going to be Cletus Cassidy, a.k.a. Carnage. Um, he's a four threat character. He's seven stamina, um, medium base, medium move. So the guy can get around quite a little bit. He's a size two, but look at that defensive stat line. Yes, he is amazing against, um, physical attacks, but five, one, one is just absolutely crazy. Um, this guy is the epitome of a glass cannon. As you may have seen from one of my recent videos, his damage output can be absolutely crazy. But actually, when you apply that into a real game where you're trying to score VPs, yes, spider foes are going to be quite attrition-focused. Um, but really, he's not bringing anything to the spider foes um, other than just pure, pure damage. And with that 1-1 one, one defensive stat line, on his energy and on his mystic, it's going to be a real struggle for him. Now, with that said, Carnage is definitely a character I think could see more play when we move into the timeline events, one of which we are hosting at the moment. Uh, I'm, I'll maybe do a video on, on my timeline list that I've put together. but um, So I think he could go up in value ever so slightly. Um, he really struggled once... Um, Doom Prophecy came out of the hands of everyone other than the Asgardians because you could just up his damage output exponentially and it was it was even crazier than what it is now. Um, but he does struggle with that 1-1 one, one stat line. And because of that 1-1 one, one stat line, guys, even though he is great at doing damage, he isn't great at doing much else. And purely just doing damage will rarely, rarely win you games. So unfortunately... Our first entry into the spider foe list is going to be a D tier. Okay, then, guys, so next up is going to be the latest addition to the spider foes, at least that we've seen the card for, and he's from the brand new Earth's Mightiest core box. It is Doc Ock, Sinister Scientist. Another four threat character, but you can see does not suffer from the same defensive problems as Carnage. He's a 4-4-3. Um, again, medium base, medium move, so plenty of movement on him. He's a size 2. He's going to have 6 stamina on his front. Um, and overall, pretty decent stats for a 4-threat character. His striking tentacles is going to be range 3. 
power equal to damage dealt on that five strength but he's got that flurry of arms when making this attack each wild in the roll counts as two successes and um, works really really well under the new captain america as well but as far as a builder goes it's pretty darn good um arm lasers 2.0 it's going to be a beam four strength for attack it's zero cost doesn't generate any power but it does dish out and incinerate on a wild so really really playing into that attrition based game that spider foes want to play and then lastly he has a scientific breakthrough which is going to be his spender range three seven strength it's going to cost four and then if this attack deals damage after the attack is resolved the target character gains guys listen to this bleed poison shock special conditions so you do one damage and you get to dish out all three of those it's very very good indeed now this new version of doc ock also comes with the sinister six um leadership and whilst i would say that that would bump him up in terms of real world and having a second leader in there we're not taking that into consideration for this because this is purely looking at playing Green Goblin spider foes and not playing under Doc Ock. So unfortunately, we can't give him any more points for that one. He's got Ox Grasp, his only active superpower. It's going to cost three. It's choose an enemy interactive terrain feature or enemy character size three or less within three and throw it short. This is not to be underestimated and the fact that it only costs three power is really really good uh, it can only be used once per turn as most throws in the game are but three power for a terrain and enemy size three throw especially off a size two character is really really good in my opinion and then he has scientific hubris and this is really for me one of the reasons why you're probably going to be able to get away with doing more arm laser attacks to dish out that incinerate even though it doesn't generate power but with scientific hubris, when this character rolls dice, after the effect is resolved, if the roll contained one or more crit results, this character gains one power. Now, there are some weird rules in this game whereby sometimes Doc Ock is rolling the dice, other times you are rolling the dice on behalf of Doc Ock. It's really weird. It's really strange. What I would say is go and check out the forums. But your main things like offensive uh, dice, so attack dice, defense dice, um, dodge dice, when you're rolling for flipping a point, all of those are going to count. Um, some others will, some others won't. Go and check out the forums, guys. There's a thread on there already because scientific hubris has been in the game since day one. So there's plenty of information on it. I'll maybe even leave a... Um, I'll maybe even leave a link down in the description below so you can go and check that out. And then lastly, he has Wall Crawler, um, which basically means that he gets to move around. Um, and it's exactly the same as Flight in terms of what it does. It means he's always going to be able to get that medium move, even going over terrain. Um, but it's not affected by things that would affect Flight. So that's pretty good. He's coming up against Bill, something like that. Bill isn't going to get those rerolls into him. Equally, something that affects Wall Crawler will just affect him and not affect those with flight, but you get how it works. Um, overall, guys, <clears throat> I really, really like this new version of Doc Ock, but, but I am thinking in my head of like, this is the Green Goblin list, and this isn't the Doc Ock list. Um, and there's there's going to be one one real main reason why I don't put him higher up than maybe what you think. Um, it's also worth mentioning he brings a pretty decent tactics card in This Is Our Day, but it is an Otto Octavius card, so the OG uh, Dr. Octopus can also use it as well. Um, but one of the reasons why, for me, I don't rank or, or rank this one as, as high in certain situations is a tactics card called well laid plans so well laid plans green goblin and dr octopus may spend three power each to play this card roll five dice for each enemy character holding an objective token the enemy character suffers one damage for each crit in each wild world and then anyone who suffers damage drops all tokens that it is holding the player playing the card 
chooses which order to to do them in um this is an absolutely amazing card and it's not going to be available in timelines but we're not ranking this just on timelines but for me that's why i prefer the older version of dr octopus alongside green goblin it's not that this version is bad it's just that i actually think the other version is better because of that card so because of that new doc ock is going to go into b tier still really really good really really strong if we were taking into consideration just building out the roster giving us that extra leadership it would probably bump him up to an a but we are just purely talking about playing under green goblin so right now he sits in b tier for me and speaking of the original Dr. Octopus, this is the three threat version from the original core box. Um, he's a three threat, which is, is quite nice. Having three threats in your roster does make that squad building much, much easier. As we know, he's already got that partnership with Green Goblin and that very, very good tactics cards that he's able to use. Um, he's got five stamina. He's a medium move on a medium base. He's size two uh, and he's got a four, three, four defensive stat line so actually as a defensive stat line he's really good and that five stamina is pretty damn good as well when i say pretty good it's it's pretty standard it does go up to six so he does have 11 stamina overall uh, as a character so slightly above the curve but that 434 stat line is definitely above average his builder is going to be a strike it's going to be range three strength four power equal to damage dealt but he has that flurry of arms so he's going to be able to count wilds as two successors and then his arm lasers so not the upgraded version but his arm lasers range four six strength it's going to cost three this attack ignores line of sight and the defending character does not benefit from cover so that can be really nice in certain matchups and in certain crises um crises who knows uh, and he's also got a pierce on there as well so really upping his damage output he's got ox clutches so it's again it's going to be a three cost but this time whilst it is still an enemy character and interactive terrain it's only a size two or less within range three and that short throw but it's still really really good and again on a three threat character having character and terrain throw is really really nice he's got that scientific hubris it's going to work in exactly the same way again i'll leave a link down in the description and he also has wall crawler um for me guys Dr. Octopus works really, or the original Dr. Octopus works really, really well alongside uh, Green Goblin, really because of that tactics card. He's very sturdy as a character as well, and the fact that he's got the ability to dish out quite a bit of damage, and he's really good at power generation. I think he's one of those characters that's often overlooked from the original core box, um, but I think he's absolutely solid. And really because of that tactics card and because of the fact that we have two versions of Doc Ock to choose from now, he's going to go up to A tier. For me, he's a character that I'm taking along with me in most situations when I'm playing um when I'm playing Green Goblin, when I'm playing Green Goblin Spider Foes, the only real exception to that would potentially be on something like a researcher where there isn't anything to pick up. So that card, well laid plans, doesn't really work. And for me, that's where the original Doc Ock would, sorry, the new version of Doc Ock would come into play. And maybe a couple of other matchups and things like that as well. But really, if you haven't tried him, try him out. He's very, very solid uh, and a character I would highly recommend. Okay, next up, guys, is going to be Wilson Fisk, aka Kingpin. Um, we've gone through his card quite recently under the Criminal Syndicate, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but he's absolutely solid. He's got his solid frame, so he doesn't suffer collision damage, which is always really, really nice. Having built in brace for free is pretty darn good. Um, he also gets to reduce all damage taken uh, by one it costs him a power but it is all damage so enemy effects and neutral effects as well he's got some pretty good things in his uh, arsenal his cane laser is not too bad headbutt is pretty decent for control hail to the king is quite nice dishing out um, dishing out the stagger and doing a throw as well on size three and then he's got his street level negotiations um I just don't think for me, 
Um, he really fits into the play style too much of Green Goblin. And one of the main reasons for that is the fact that he's very, very slow. Um, and really that cane laser, a beam three, you kind of want something a little bit better. Really, Kingpin needs to be up close and personal so he can use those throws, so he can use his headbutt, he can use his hail to the king. Um, and he does really, really struggle getting up the board and actually getting into the mix of things. Um, I still think he's perfectly fine, perfectly serviceable, but for me, he's going to go into C tier. Okay then guys, next up is going to be Craven the Hunter, aka Sergei Nikolaevich Kravinov. I'm pretty sure I butchered that and I'm pretty sure I pronounce it differently every single time I say it. Um, he's another three threat character, he's threes across the board, he's a small base medium move, he's got five stamina on his front and he's a size two character. He has a, a really weird thing going on with his attacks in that he only has two builders, um, but they have really good synergy with each other. So on a Kukri strike, it's going to be range two, five strength, um, and it's going to be um, a flat one, one power gainer. Um, but after the attack of resolve, the target character gains bleed, so a guaranteed bleed. And on a wild, he's going to get an elusive, which lets him advance short, which is really, really nice. His spear thrust is another builder. It's a range three strength four, and it's power equal to damage. Don't they? You may be thinking, well, that's not particularly good. But if he's already attacked with his cookery strike during this activation, um, and it's got to be the same, the same target, he gets to add three dice to his attack roll. And... If this character has advanced or been placed during its activation after this turn, after the attack is resolved, it may advance short. So if you get that elusive on the cookery strike, letting you basically advance short, you're going to get the three extra dice, making it a seven. And a seven dice builder at range three on a three threat character is very, very good indeed. Um, and you're going to get an extra medium move off the back of there. Do not underestimate Craven the Hunter. As a three threat, he can dish out, as a, in, in terms of single target damage, can dish out a huge, huge amount of damage. He's also got a couple of uh, active superpowers. Uh, so, um, for active, yeah, active superpowers. Got my wording wrong then. Um, first of all, Corn of the Beast. This is going to cost two power. Choose an enemy character within three of this character. Until the end of its next activation, each time the chosen character advances or climbs, it suffers one damage. If the chosen character has the wall crawler superpower, it loses the wall crawler superpower until the end of its next activation. I really like this. It's really thematic. It's not something you use a lot, but when you can get it off, especially on particular terrain setups and that kind of thing, um, it can be really, really effective of just making sure that an opponent can't run away from you. He's also then got Expert Tracker. This is going to cost three. Choose an enemy allied, sorry, choose an enemy character. Allied characters, so that includes himself, roll one additional attack die when targeting the chosen character with attacks this round. So Craven's going to be one of those characters that if you've got a big character on the board that you want to take down, getting this off early and giving everybody else in your team that one extra dice is really, really nice. Or just giving yourself a six dice cookery strike and a eight dice spear thrust for three power is really, really good indeed. And then lastly, the Elixir of Calypso. This character may reroll one die in its attack or defense rolls. Again, giving him some much, much... Uh, needed dice manipulation, especially on that elusive, uh, but increasing his damage output and making him that little bit more survivable. And once we couple this with the Oscorp weaponry, where you can not only reroll one of your die, but reroll one of your opponent's defense die, on that seven dice attack, it can be absolutely brutal. I really, really like Craven the Hunter. Um, he does come with the Team Tactics card. Um, the less said about that, the better. Fearful Symmetry. Um, yeah, let's just leave that one there, shall we? It's not particularly good. I've actually never seen it being played, or at least I've never seen it being pulled off. Um, if it works, it could be pretty good, but it's it's it, it's not good at all. Um, he's an absolutely solid three threat. He's a character that I'm most definitely taking in every Spider-Foes 
roster that I build. Um, and for me, he is really, really good. And he does earn himself a spot in that A tier. But he is going just behind Doc Ock. Uh, because if I can take Doc Ock or Craven the Hunter, I'm probably going with Doc Ock again, depending on the setup. Okay, then, guys, next up is Curtis Connors, a.k.a. Lizard. Another three-threat character, and a character who um, is a little bit of a weird one because you don't really often make attacks with Lizard. Um, he's an absolutely great extract player character. He is so, so difficult to take down. He's got some great control uh, with his push on Tail Whip, but also that biochemical breakthrough. It's going to cost three. And again, it's another throw. This is really something that you see throughout Spider-Foes. The amount of non-attack damage that they have access to is very, very high in the form of throws and other such things like that. He's also got that thick hide and that healing factor keeps him alive much, much longer than what you would expect. Six, three, three, sorry, four, three, three stat line with six defense, plus all these other things that he's got makes him a very, very tanky um three threat character medium base medium move as well uh, so he can get up to the middle of the board quite easily um he's absolutely solid he does come with a tactics card monkey brain is lizard home and it's not a bad tactics card it's an area to attack he spends three power and after each attack is resolved the, t the target character is pushed away from his character short so if you're on something like a gamma wave or a researcher Doing this as a last activation, as a control piece, can be absolutely devastating for your opponent. I just often find with the plethora of tactics cards that these characters bring, I just don't find myself having enough space to be able to take it with me. But if you do take it in the right scenario, it can be really, really good indeed. Um, like I say, he isn't going to benefit too much from... Oscorp weaponry because he isn't going to be making too many attacks um yes it might mean that you get an extra you know bit of damage through on tail whip but generally you're going to be wanting to use him for his throws rather than that cold blooded and his power generation isn't the best because that tail whip is only a three four um but with all that said and done he's an absolutely solid character he's a great extract player um for me he's going to go into b tier Okay then guys, next up is going to be Mysterio, aka Quentin Beck, bringing some much needed mystic attacks to the Spider-Foes team. In fact, I believe the only character who is Spider-Foes affiliated, at least at the moment, that has mystic attacks. Uh, he's got six stamina on his front, he's a small base and a short move, which does hamper him a little bit, but I'll explain why I don't think that's too much of a problem for him he's size two he's another three threat and he has a one one five stat line we'll get to, back to that as we take a look through some of his other abilities but starting out he's got hypnosis gas it's going to be range three it's going to be strength four it's going to be zero cost and it's power equal to damage dealt if this attack deals damage after this attack is resolved this character may advance the target character short why is that really nice well do you remember the other side of Green Goblin's card? It pairs really, really nicely with that indeed. It does need to do damage, and then only four dice, that can be difficult, but he does have those rerolls that he can apply, or that reroll he can apply to his opponent's dice, just to try and make sure you do get it off. Um, but this is, I think this is a really, really nice attack. And then his builder is going to be Curtain Call. It's going to be range two, strength six and it's going to cost four if this attack deals damage and if the target character is size two or less after the attack is resolved it may be thrown short so this one won't trigger um the 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 ability on green goblin but it's still quite nice so moving down we've got tricks and traps the only superpower that mysterio has it's going to cost him three to play and it is a reactive when an enemy character ends a movement so that is anything place throne push advance climb whatever it is um, within range three of this character this character may use this superpower so you roll four dice and then for every crit and wild world you do one damage to your opponent 
If this superpower does at least one damage, this character may advance short. And you'll see, in fact, let's jump through a couple here just to kind of explain why that's good. So he also has stealth. So characters must be within range three of this character to target it with attacks. So the idea is you move in, he gets to play his tricks and traps, and then he gets to move back out of range three. And then guess what, guys? If you do it again, he gets to do it again. So you can see how it can become really, really frustrating for your opponent. Um, and it's one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons why that 115 stat line really doesn't matter as much on Mysterio as it does on Carnage. Um, he's then got Master of Illusions, his first innate ability. Whenever this character rolls dice, after the effect is resolved, it gains one power if it rolled at least one blank. Additionally, this character uses its mystic defense when making a dodge roll. So reason number two why that 115 stat line doesn't matter as much is he gets to roll his five dice against incoming uh, collision damage, uh, which is really, really nice. Like five dice for um, as if it was your defensive tech is really, really good. And then lastly, the other reason why that 115 stat line is not as bad as you may first see, smoke and mirrors. When an enemy character targets this character with an attack, this character may use its mystic defense regardless of the attack's type unless the attacking character pays two power. Now, whilst this is something your opponent can very easily bypass, power generation, especially early in the game, is something that people really need to take into consideration. And all of a sudden, doing a builder that's now costing two power, um, even though you're rolling it into, you know, only one die, um, really, really does hurt your opponent and means that it potentially turns things off lower down in their card because they don't get the power generation that they need to be able to do it. Um, so all of those combined guys make Mysterio for me a, first of all, very, very interesting character, um, but a character that is absolutely brilliant at being a back point holder. If there is anyone within three, he can do his hypnosis gas and advance them away. If somebody comes within three, he can do his tricks and traps and get out of the way. And then when you activate him, he can just do his hypnosis gas again. Um, it's He's a really, really interesting character. He's a little bit more of a scalpel than a hammer like some of the other ones are, but played correctly can be really, really effective. He also brings a pretty nice tactics card called the Grand Illusion. He spends four power, and then until the end of the cleanup phase, when an enemy character makes an attack, defense, or dodge roll, whilst within range three of Mysterio, it does not add dice to the roll for crit results. So effectively giving them hex, um, which is, which is pretty damn good. But there is a kicker on it. Mysterio changes all of his crit results to failures, um, which, you know, is a little bit of a kicker, but um, that does happen at the very end of the dice modification phase. So if you've got any rerolls and things in there that you can use, you can always reroll those crits and try and get them to something else. Um, but for a one turn, it's it's pretty, pretty nice um, and really pairs into that attrition game where they want to pounce on you and, and really take down those big characters as quickly as they can. So with all that said and done, guys, Mysterio is an absolutely solid character for me. Um, I think he works really, really well in, in most, not all, situations. So for me, he's going to go to that top end of B tier. He brings some much, much needed mystic attacks like we've already mentioned, um, but he is just very, very solid and does a really, really good job under Green Goblin's leadership. Okay then guys, next up we have got Alexei Sistevich, aka the Rhino. Um, you see this guy splashed absolutely everywhere. He's such a good character. Um, he's a character that at first glance you may look at him and go, well what on earth does he do? He's got a 3-3-2 stat line. For a 4 threat that's pretty low, but he does have 7 stamina. He's size 4, meaning that there's not that many characters in the game that are going to be able to throw and push him around. And he is only a short move, but it is on a large base, so it really doesn't matter too much. And you'll find out the amount of movement he's got in a moment. But um, 
Here's what attack. Go. Uh, it's range three, it's strength five, and it's zero cost. It's going to be power equal to the damage dealt, but before damage is dealt, he gets to place this character, or he gets to place himself within range one of the target character. So giving him some huge amount of movement turn one, which is really, really nice indeed. Um, his first active superpower or his active ability is going to be Stampede. Costs three. This character is pushed medium. If it does not stop, it does not stop if its movement if it contacts a size two or smaller interactive terrain feature. Instead, the contacted terrain feature is destroyed and this character continues being pushed. The next time it makes a gore attack this turn, add two dice to the attack roll. This superpower can only be used once per turn. Um, so it takes gore up from a five dice attack up to a seven dice, which is really nice. Um, and it can get rid of some terrain features that you don't want around. Now, you know, Green Goblin's got his thing, but again, it can be it can be really, really good. And it gets him about the board so, so much. We've then got Nobody Ever Accuse the Rhino of Good Manners. It's going to cost three. Choose an interactive terrain feature of size four or less within two and throw it medium. Um, this and Stampede are only once, once per turn, but size four throw coming in, guys, is utterly brutal. Um, it's a character that can get rid of those big terrain pieces before your opponent can, which is really nice. And the three cost is very, very reasonable for this. He's got aggressive after an attack target and his character is resolved. If it suffered damage, it may advance short towards the attacking character. And he's got ornery. When this character is damaged by an enemy or allied effect, after the effect is resolved, if he is not dazed, it gains one power. So he takes one damage and he's going to gain two power for it. Meaning he's... Whilst he only has that one builder and no real other way to generate power, Stampede and nobody ever accused the Rhino of good manners become that much easier to turn on because of his extra power generation. And then lastly, he's got Rhino Hide. When this character would suffer damage from an enemy effect, reduce the amount of uh, reduce the amount suffered by one to a minimum of one. Cost nothing. Pretty standard. Um, um, damage deflection there that we've got. Um, overall, guys, I really, really like Rhino. Uh, he does come with a couple of tactics cards. Rhino in a China shop is... Uh, yeah. It's a yeah. Um, Rhino may play this card at the beginning of his activation. The next attack Rhino makes, this activation adds dice equal to all the combined size of all the terrain features destroyed this activation. At the end of the activation, Rhino suffers two damage. Um, now, the reason it's two is that he gets to negate it by one. Uh, I want to say that, and then I want to double check. No, he doesn't get to negate it by one because it's not an enemy effect. So he does take the full two. Um, but this is supposed to sort of pair with nobody ever accused the Rhino of good manners and his stampede. Um, but I just think the opportunity cost for this card for a one big off attack on a builder that doesn't really have any sort of dice manipulation or anything like that um it's probably not a card that you are taking along with you however this is a robbery or rhinobbery as it is more commonly known is definitely a card that you are going to be taking with you and is going to be stapled to rhino and is one of the reasons why he is going to be ranked so high if it is Rhino's activation, he may spend two power to play this card. Choose an enemy character within range one that is holding an objective token. The chosen character drops any objective tokens it is holding. So if it's multiple, it drops them all. Rhino then throws the chosen character medium. This is better than a steal because it's a steal that takes everything. Um, yes, you need to pay the power to pick them up afterwards, but that's by the by. Um, and you get a, a throw off the back end of it. It's very, very good indeed. Um, it needs to be stapled to Rhino. If you're taking Rhino, you take that card. It makes him so, so effective from a control play. Uh, and it's just something your opponent can do nothing about um it's really really good he's an absolutely solid character he goes straight the way up to the well i say the top of s tier but the only character in s tier at the moment 
And rounding it out, guys, is one of the oldest characters in the game. I think he may have been sort of the third release or something like that after the core box and the first couple of others. But it is Venom, a.k.a. Eddie Brock. One of my favourite four threats in the game. Um, he's seven stamina. He is a short move, but he does have that medium base, which gives him a little bit of extra movement. Size three, four, two, three stat line. Um, that two has really hurt him of late, especially up against Guardians and things like that. Uh, and we'll get into some of the other things that he does there as well. But he's got Symbiote Tendrils Range 3, uh, Strength 5, 0, Cost Power equal to Damage Dealt. And again, it is a one of those ability or one of those attacks that gives that a guaranteed bleed condition, which is really, really good. And then we have We Are Venom. Range 3, 7 strength, 3 cost. After this attack is resolved, this character removes one damage from itself for each damage inflicted. Um, on a seven dice attack, guys, um, especially when you see some of the other things that he's got, especially when we compare it with, or, or, we, or we couple it with the uh, leadership from Green Goblin, um, it's a really, really nice way of being able to heal him up. Um, Clintar Rage, again, another character in this list that has a terrain and enemy character throw. It's going to be three cost, it's going to be within range two, and it's going to be a medium throw, so very, very solid. But he also has Web Snare. And this is one of the reasons why that short move is less impactful for Venom as it is on other characters, because push an enemy character within range four towards this character medium and it only costs two yes you can only use it on each character once per turn so a character can be pushed by this superpower only once per turn but for displacement for pulling somebody up to you so you can get them within range three um it's really really good indeed and then so many snacks after an attack against this character is resolved it may use this superpower if the attacker is within range three, the character, this character even, may make an attack against the attacker. This superpower can only be used once per turn. Now, we'll get into his tactics card in a minute and how that couples really, really well um, with that. But key things to note here are it only costs two and it can be any attack. So if you have the power to be able to do a We Are Venom, you can spend the three power to do a We Are Venom inflict damage on your opponent and potentially remove all or some of that damage that was done to you in the first place. He's got symbiote instincts. When this character is attacking, the defending character cannot modify their defense dice. Um, now, modification is a few things. It's going to be rerolls. It's going to be any of the crazy stuff that you can do with leaderships, but it's also cover. Cover does not work against Venom because changing what you do in cover is you change a, a not a failure result but a non-success result into a block and that is a dice modification so against venom guys cover does not work and then lastly he has got wall crawler but that is not it for venom because i do want to talk about lethal protector unaffiliated reactive tactics card when the enemy character targets an allied character within range three of an allied venom with an attack, Venom may spend two power to play this card. Place Venom within range one of the allied character. Venom becomes the target of the attack, regardless of range and line of sight. So the idea is you use this to protect one of your other characters. They do the attack against Venom. Venom gets some more power. He then uses his so many stacks that costs him two. And then if he's got the power, he can use a We Are Venom to do a We Are Venom back and potentially heal that damage off, pretty much negating everything your opponent's done um, and getting to dish out some damage um, while he's at it. Um, I really, really, really like Venom. Uh, he makes it into every single one of my spider foes. The two things that he are susceptible or that he is susceptible to is going to be energy attacks and it's going to be attacks that are outside of range three because he doesn't get to use his so many snacks, which is why in a world where guardians are played quite a lot and you've got um, Rocket with his range five attack that's energy, 
you've got Star Lord with his range four attack. That's energy. Um, it's it's a bit of a struggle for Venom, but even saying all of that, he is very very good indeed. He does absolute work. And he is, guys, maybe surprising to some, going up to S tier for me. Uh, I think he's really, really solid. Um, Rhino just edges it for me in terms of the, the best character. Um, but he is a close, close second. Um, even with that two energy defense, because of everything that he can do, all of those reactive abilities, um, it's, yeah, it, it, it's really, really good indeed. So, uh, And by the way, that's so many snacks. Um, because it's once per turn for Green Goblin's leadership, you're going to be able to get to use that leadership even more because he's got that reactive ability that's going to be happening during your opponent's turn as well. And there we go, guys. That is my breakdown of all things Spider-Foes under the OG leader, Green Goblin, a.k.a. Norman Osborn. As always, guys, let me know down in the comments below. Do you agree? Do you disagree? spider Foes are an affiliation that I've dabbled with quite a bit. As I said, not played with them a huge amount of late, but I cannot wait for those new characters to come along. We've got Sandman, we've got Shocker, uh, we've got Vulture coming along as well. Um, I think there's one other as well that I forgot, but um, yeah, some really, really cool characters coming in. Uh, and I can't wait for them to be a bit more rounded out because only having 10 characters um, is a little bit difficult, especially when one of them is a, is a double up and a couple of them you really don't want to be taking. Um, these are one of the affiliations that I think are going to do really, really well in timelines. They're an affiliation I've included in my timeline roster. Uh, and if you haven't played them, I would highly recommend checking them out because they are a lot of fun to play. Guys, I want to give a big shout out to all of our Patreons. Thank you so much uh, for supporting me over the whole of 2023. It's really, really appreciated. And if you do want to support us on Patreon, you can do so from as little as a pound a month. There'll be a link down in the description below. Um, but you don't need to support us on Patreon to help the channel out. Um, simply hitting that like button commenting, sharing our content is greatly appreciated. And guys, if you haven't hit that subscribe button yet, if you could, it would be greatly appreciated. We are on our way to 6,000 subscribers. I really wanted to try and get there before the end of the year. I appreciate the frequency of my content hasn't been as high of late. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that I won't get into. The croaky voice is probably something that should give, give it away. Um, but if you could hit that subscribe button, it'd be greatly appreciated. Only about 50% of you that watch these videos are subscribed. So if you could, it would mean the absolute world to me. Uh, guys, also head on over to our Discord. It's completely free to join. We talk all things MCP and it's where you'll see all of our announcements for all of the different events that we are running. We do have our first ever timeline event that's going to be running. Well, has already started. It'll be running into 2024. And keep an eye out because we are going to be doing the Champion of Champions again as well so keeping out for that probably early february time in 2024 but best place to get all of those notifications is going to be over on discord and with all that said and done guys it leaves me with just enough time to say stay well keep safe and until next time bye for now